fasting. Is fasting a familiar practice in your life? Have you ever done a specific fast for a specific reason? Well, some of the things that come to mind is, yep, certain blood tests, you've got to do a fast, right? Or certain procedures, you've got to say, okay, after midnight, I can't eat anything. Or after 6 o'clock, depending on what the time is. And when I've had to do that, I will tell you my human response. As soon as, the, as, soon as I say I can't have it, I never want it anymore. <laughs> so we're familiar with that kind of fast. And also, I would encourage us that we're actually very, very, very familiar with fasting. Every one of us eats breakfast every day. Right? Now, some people might be saying, no, here, I don't eat breakfast in the morning. I don't care what time you eat your first meal. We all have a first meal every day. It might be at 7 o'clock. It might be at noon. But we break fast. Why? Because none of us eat as we're sleeping at night. So we are familiar with fasting, aren't we? Fasting as a specific act of sacrifice, of refraining from eating food as a spiritual exercise. That type of fasting we may or may not be that familiar with. Well, this passage for the prophet Isaiah focuses on fasting in particular, but especially on the nation, the southern kingdom of Judah, and their practice of religion at the time of fasting. Because the prophet Isaiah prophesied to Judah, the two tribes of the south that include the city of Jerusalem. And the prophet Isaiah warned against the wickedness of that in his time. What's interesting, and this is oftentimes said, and in fact Jesus focused and said that prophets were hated and prophets were killed. And indeed the tradition is that the prophet Isaiah was martyred in about 536 before the common era, about 500 years before Christ. They didn't want to hear his message. The question is, do we want to hear the prophet of Isaiah, the message that God gave the prophet of Isaiah? In one sense, today's message is extremely simple, and yet it's also very challenging. And at the same time that I say it's challenging, it isn't really. It boils down to, are we obedient? Do we want to live a life that pleases God by directly obeying God's teaching. That's what it comes down to. And it's then our choice. It begins, I'm just going to review quickly, but hopefully help to unpack some of the details of this story. Shout aloud, do not hold back, raise your voice like a trumpet. God is instructing Jeremiah, or I'm sorry, Isaiah, to raise his voice like a trumpet. In other words, this is not a quiet message. This is to be broadcast with great vigor and strength. What is the prophet Isaiah highlighting? Basically, the nation of Judah and Jerusalem during the time of his prophecy was booming. Religion and the practice of religion was at an all-time high. People were going to the temple, people were bringing uh, their offerings, they were very enthused to practice their faith. They seemed eager to know my ways, he says in chapter 2, as if they were a nation that does what is right and has not forsaken my command. So simply stated, Prophet Isaiah identified that the nation, the southern kingdom of Judah, was window dressing. The former religion was wonderful, but they were turning around and not following the basic commands that God had given to the nation.
Not only were they not following the commands, they were complaining. In verse 3, they said, why have we fasted? Why have we been so pious? Why have we humbled ourselves before God? God isn't listening to us. God isn't even answering the prayers, like our prayers, the way we want God to answer our prayers. People complaining to God, look at how eager we worship, look at how eager we humble ourselves, we're even fasting, and yet don't even notice. Really? You think God doesn't know what's going on? Think again. Observe what God does notice. On the day you're fasting, you do as you please. And you, leaders, farm owners of property, business people, you exploit your workers. Yeah, you're pious, you're going, and you've got dressed up with your finest, you're going, and you're fasting, and you're doing everything right, but bottom line, you know in your heart of hearts you're exploiting the people who work for you. You're taking advantage of them. Not only that, ready for this? Your fasting ends up in quarreling and strife, strife and in striking each other with wicked fists. That's a metaphor for you, isn't it? Wicked fists. They're getting into fist fights. They're going out and fasting, and then they're turning around. Not only are they exploiting their workers, but on a personal level, they're engaged in brawling. What's the basic definition of a fight? I'm stronger than you, or I don't like what you're doing, so I'm going to beat you. Right? I mean, it's pretty simple. It's person to person. You cannot fast as you do today. In other words, the present practice of fasts to, the, to Isaiah's words. And expect your voice to be heard on high. This is not the kind of fasting that I like. The fasting I have chosen Loose the chains of injustice. Untie the cords of the yoke to set free those who are oppressed under the yoke. See, this is something Jesus talked about. Jesus criticized the corruption in the temple. Jesus criticized the priests for their unfair practices. Jesus criticized the Pharisees that said, you love to heap on the shoulders of the people the burden of keeping the law, and you don't lift a finger to help them bear the burden. The fasting I desire, God is saying, when you see somebody naked, you clothe them. You don't turn away from your own flesh and blood, even those who were Jews members of the same nation that were being oppressed, they weren't taken care of. No less the foreigner, the alien in their midst, the laborers. See, it boils down to God and the fasting that God loves, the fasting that God desires, the sacrifice, the putting aside intentionally is obedience rather than ritual. And when we do that, as a people of faith, Isaiah promises, your light, light is truth, shine the light of day on issues. Don't hide in the darkness, but do out in the open what is right before God. The light of truth, the light of obedience, the light of love. Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. We can't be a people of the light and then hide in the darkness, is what Isaiah said first to those he prophesied to and now to us. The light will break forth like dawn and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. When we shine and live by the light of truth, God watches for us, over us. God protects us. The rear guard, God has our back, to put it in everyday language. We're not, we're vulnerable in the back. We can be attacked and not see, 
But if we have somebody protecting us, we don't have to worry about that. If you do away with the yoke of oppression, with the pointing of finger and malice talk, and if you spend yourselves in, on, in behalf of the hungry and satisfy, satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness and your night will become as noonday. Oppression, nakedness, hunger, basic human necessities. If that is your focus, to truly love and use the resources God has committed to your care to do that, then the light of that truth will make even the mid, middle of the night shine like the day. Loving kindness, taking care of the powerless. And then in conclusion, God will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land and will strengthen your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. Sun-scorched. You know what that looks like, don't we? Anybody who's gone through a drought with a garden and you can't water it, you know what it looks like after a period of time. But we also know that plants that have deep roots and go down to the source of water, that even though it can look dry on the outside, they thrive and are healthy. Because ultimately, all plants need water. And Jesus said, I'm the living water. And where's that source? It's not external. Jesus promised that that source would spring up from within us. So that if we commit ourselves to live a right life before God in obedience, then Jesus and God and the prophecy of Isaiah says that source will come from within us. And we will always be like a well-watered garden with sufficiency for our lives. True spiritual fasting is pleasing God, putting God first, and taking care of the powerless. Practical application. That's why I asked to dawn on me, I don't know why I did it before, but seek ye first the kingdom of God. See, if we stop there, we miss the point, don't we? If we just seek God first, and we come and we dress in our finest, and we come and we worship, and we dedicate time, and we fast, and we go through all, we can even study God's word and commit ourselves to learning. And if we stop there, then we run the risk of being judged, like Isaiah judged the people of his day. <clears throat> Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and its righteousness, right standing, obedience to what God has taught us. It's hand in glove. It's the marriage of the two. It's our will in obedience to following God's teaching so that God's will overrides and empowers our lives. It really is as simple as that. So how does that get played out? First of all, I was reminded in Judy's report that when we went to mission works last fall, that the Reverend Dr. Doug Scalise, third generation pastor, pastor of Brewster Baptist, one of the biggest um, American Baptist churches in Massachusetts, cited that missions is what drives their church. And their first dollar goes to missions. One of the practical demonstrations of that is their Christmas offering, their special Christmas offering, is collected and it goes to help retired ministers and missionaries who need financial support after they're retired because they don't have sufficient funds. Taking care of our own. Right. Missions comes first. Now, in all fairness, I have not heard this for a long time, but when I first came to this church, oh, no, no, missions, we've got to take care of ourselves first. Does that fit into this message? Wellspring, a hand up, not a hand out. We support Wellspring through our missions dollars. 
Hingham Food Pantry, we support through our missions dollars. And individually, do we respond to appeals? One great hour of sharing, emergency relief funds collected by our denomination, not a penny goes to administrative costs, every dollar goes 100% to helping someplace where we have people that know where it is best used. I was naked and you clothed me. I was hungry and you fed me. These are direct applications of the teaching of Jesus. That is, the God was first revealed, the teaching of Isaiah, the prophecy to the people of Israel. First fruits. Is there any doubt in Scripture that tithing is taught? 10%? It's pretty straightforward, isn't it? That's not a surprise to anybody here. Anybody who has spent any time in and around a church, any time studying Scripture, we know that truth. First fruits. That's an agricultural concept. Okay? It's whatever the fruit is. Grain, grapes, doesn't matter. Whatever you harvest, you collect it, and then from that first harvest, you give a portion to God. That's the principle. It's not, okay, God... I'm harvesting my wheat, and once I know I can feed my family all through the week, once I'm all through the winter, once I know I'm going to earn enough money from it, then I'll give you a little bit back, a little kickback. That's not how first fruit works. So how does that work in today's? You get a paycheck. You get your Social Security check. You look at it. And you decide how much you're going to give before you pay any other bill. And that becomes your gift of first fruits. When we do that, that's obedience. And when we do that, we're acknowledging, wait a second, it's not mine. Everything belongs to God. God has simply entrusted each one of us in different measures, because that's the way it is. Can't explain why. But we have all different levels of resources, but God has resourced every one of our lives sitting here in this room. And God has instructed us that if we want to seek the kingdom first, and if we want to be righteous, right standing in the eyes of God, then we're to bring our first fruits to God. It's that simple. It's not that easy. And I also would say when it comes to Values as reflected in this passage. When we look at the political arena that we're living in, I'm not telling you who to vote for, I'm not telling you the position you take, but I would look for within our public leaders, whether it's local selectmen, state level, or federal level, I would look at the stands that they take when it comes to taking care of the poor, the naked, and the powerless. That's a reflection of the ethical teachings of Scripture, both Old Testament as well as the Gospels. Is it easy? Not necessarily. Is being obedient worth it? God said that if we just do window dressing, it's not that God doesn't know but will God answer those prayers? But if we worship God and we say we seek your righteousness, then God's promise that his grace will be sufficient, that he hears our prayers and will empower our lives. It doesn't say we're going to get rich, but God's grace will be sufficient for all of our true needs. In conclusion, and to tie together the themes that I've proclaimed. Number one, those that have ears to hear, those that have a heart to hear, please take to heart the message that Isaiah brought to the nation of Judah. Consider reviewing this passage and thinking about it and meditating on it and say, do I believe it? Do I believe this message? Do I live it? And then also consider taking a <coughs> bulletin and take a little comfort in the words of the psalmist. Lord, you gave your orders to be 
obeyed completely. I wish I were more loyal in obeying your demands. The psalmist is writing this. The one gifted, the one who is inspired by the Holy Spirit to write scripture, he's self-disclosing. I wish I did it better. Then I would not be ashamed when I study your commands. See, sometimes we avoid certain teachings in scripture, right? It's like we don't want to hear the message. If I were more obedient, then I wouldn't avoid reading parts of scripture. Studying God's commands, I learned that your laws are fair. I praised you with an honest heart. I will obey your demands 